Calcite News podcast series. Today we'll be talking about Amulet Pharma's work to advance therapeutic peptides to treat rare endocrine and metabolic diseases. And to do that, we have Dr. Abribat joining us today to do just that. So doctor, thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. Hello, uh, good afternoon, Adrian. Thank you very much for having me in. Well, the pleasure is ours. So we did some homework on your background and found that you earned your PhD from the National Polytechnic Institute of Toulouse and that you began your career as a scientist at Sanofi in Toulouse, France, and then at University of Montreal and as a consultant to the biopharmaceutical industry. Could you share with our audience what drove your interest in going to work for a pharmaceutical company and what got you on your current career path? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's back to a few years ago, right? Uh, many years ago now. Uh, in fact, prior to uh, to to performing a, a PhD, uh, my first training is a doctor in veterinary medicine. So I was meant to be a, a practicing a veterinarian, and during my my studies, I, I began to make some internships. At Sanofi, and then I worked uh, for them, and I, I discovered science. Um, and uh, really, I was uh, very much attracted by innovation, by science, by doing something that uh, did not exist before. Uh, and uh, it has been um, the um, really the uh, the most important thing in the, at the beginning of, of my career. I came back to the academic space at University of Montreal because I wanted to spend a few years as a, as, as a scientist. Uh, uh, basically, I was very much interested in that. And then at some point, uh, because I had I had filed some patents that were had been developed by uh, by the pharma industry, uh, I really wanted to be part of it. Uh, and from science, I've been very much attracted by innovation, uh, the capacity of uh, from science converting uh, scientific concept uh, and project and patents into uh, something that can become a drug, that can bring something positive uh, clinical benefit uh, to the patient. Uh, has been very attractive to me. Uh, and that's why to me very logically, uh, the biotech industry where you have uh, uh, small uh, companies that can move a project uh, pretty rapidly um, uh, has been uh, uh, really the basis of my career. So this has been uh, uh, the, um, the most important driver in my uh, 30 years plus career so far. Now let's jump forward then to Amulet Pharma, which was founded in 2014. Can you share more on how the company was founded and what the primary focus of this company is? So Amulet Pharma is a third company uh, have uh, founded as a biotech company. The first two companies were smaller companies uh, with a single asset or single drug in development. And uh, my experience at that time had been that uh, if you, uh, the both companies have, have been sold to, uh, to, to larger companies at some point, US companies, one to jazz pharmaceuticals in the Bay Area, the other one to, uh, to Melendo therapeutic, uh, Therapeutics in Michigan. And when I decided to, uh, to found the uh, third one, I wanted to build something uh, larger that would be uh, more sustainable, that could have an impact, not only an impact uh, to the patient, which is important, but also uh, a company that can uh, uh, sustain longer, uh, create longer term jobs. Uh, and uh, that's why we have created uh, Alize Pharma Tree that has changed name, rebranded to Amolite Pharma last year. Uh, it's a company where we are developing, uh, building and developing a portfolio of therapeutic peptides for rare endocrine and metabolic disease. And this is a company that is much better uh, capitalized. We, we got uh, quite large investments when we really launched the company in 2019 uh, through a, a $75 million Series A financing mm -hmm. to be able to uh, operationalize and build this, uh, this portfolio and uh, if possible, move it at some point to, uh, to approval. So let's, I'm going to talk then about the primary disease targets then of your company uh, and your investigational products such as AZP3601, AZP3404, AZP and AZP38XX and how they might make a difference in patients' lives. Could you expand on that? 
So we are working on the rare endocrine disease. This is our primary target. Uh, the reason is that we uh, collectively, the team, uh, most of the people in the team are people I've worked with in previous ventures, and we have experience in developing that kind of uh, product through the clinical development and even to approval. And rare endocrine disease are disease where you have a, a, an abnormal uh, uh, hormonal regulation. So our lead program that is at the clinical stage now in, is in hypoparathyroidism. Hypoparathyroidism is a disease uh, that, that is characterized by a deficiency in uh, parathyroid hormone, BTH, uh, that is a key hormone uh, for the regulation of calcium metabolism in the body. Uh, those patients, they have hypocalcemia, they have uh, symptoms, they have kidney problems. Uh, and so we are developing a PTH analog, an analog of uh, parathyroid hormone that we have in license from the uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, General Hospital in Boston, where there's a, a group of uh, uh, leading scientists in the field uh, who have developed, uh, designed this analog. So we are developing this analog uh, for, uh, for the treatment of the disease. Now, your drug AZP3601 is the first one to make it to clinical trials. Uh, and can you update our audience on the trial? What are the key endpoints? So we have announced uh, in October of last year that we are launching the uh, first clinical trial with this PT AZP3601, which is this PTH analog we are developing for hypoparathyroidism. It's a quite special phase one program uh, because it is going to include both healthy volunteers and patients. So uh, we wanted to accelerate the access to the patients with, uh, with our product. Uh, the, um, in a first step, we have to go according to regulatory guidelines, as you know, uh, to single administration and multiple ascending dose uh, administration in the healthy volunteers. We already be able to look at the, uh, the effect of the product on serum calcium, uh, minimizing the impact on urinary calcium and also a very important uh, differentiating point for our product is the uh, impact on the bone. So we'll measure the, uh, the uh, uh, bone biomarkers to, uh, because we really want to develop a drug that have a minimal impact on the bone. Uh, ju just to make uh, a point on that, this is a special population, uh, hypoparathyroidism patients. Most, the vast majority are women uh, typically middle-aged, two-thirds of them are in peri- or post-menopausal stage. So they already are in a, in a stage of bone loss. So they are going, some of them are going to be at risk of osteoporosis. So it's very important to develop drugs that do not have an impact on the bone, whereas PTH is regulating bone too. So we'll, we'll have a special uh, 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 scrutiny for that. And then we'll be able to move to, uh, to uh, in the second, so we'll have those data in healthy volunteers by uh, Q3 of 2021. Uh, meanwhile, we'll have moved to the uh, patients part of this uh, phase one. Uh, we'll enroll several cohorts of patients. And very interestingly, in those patients, as we will increase the dose of phase 8P3601, we'll be able to observe, uh, we expect to see a decrease in the need for calcium and vitamin D supplementation in, in, in these uh, patients, which is a conventional treatment. And also, uh, we expect and to see that it's going to decrease their uh, urinary calcium and also uh, still have a natural effect on the bone. So we should have those data uh, in the first half of 2022. Uh, and it's going to be very important uh, for us and for the patients because uh, it's going to be uh, the first uh, proof of concept of the uh, uh, effectiveness and even efficacy of the product in, uh, for, for the disease. So, so after this concludes, after the phase one concludes, what would be next, the phase two, or would you be able to fast track a phase three? 
Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question because the reason why we have designed such a, a large phase one, including healthy volunteers and patients, uh, it's, 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 it's to, go, to go fast, to bring the product to the patients. And also at the, at the regulatory level, uh, we, we expect to have uh, uh, the necessary information uh, to design the next clinical trial that we will power sufficiently for it to be a pivotal trial to, and it would, uh, uh, if we can do that, uh, we can accelerate uh, the path to, uh, to approval. Which would be fascinating. So then let's talk about your other uh, early stage therapies. When do you expect these to make it into human trials? So 2021 and early 2022, we'll have a clinical data for 3601, and we have these two other pro programs that are early, earlier stage. We have uh, this uh, second program that is under uh, what is called the IND enabling uh, studies to be able to be clinical in 2022. Uh, SNP 3404 is another therapeutic peptide that has a strong effect on uh, improving insulin sensitivity and decreasing fat deposition, at least in animal models, what we have seen so far. Uh, and we expect to be able to launch uh, clinical development in 2022. As for the third program uh, that we have uh, announced in December of last year, so very recently, uh, that we are developing through a partnership with a Japanese company uh, uh, named Peptide dream. Um, we have, uh, uh, this is going to be a, a short peptide that is a, a potent growth hormone receptor or antagonist uh, that uh, could be at the clinical stage also by the end of 2022 for the for treatment of acromegaly. Now, for our audience, could you talk about how big the market is for these rare and debilitating endocrine and metabolic disorders? How many people worldwide struggle with conditions that the comp that your company can help someday? You know, rare diseases are go, go from ultra rare, a few hundreds of patients in the world, to uh, classical orphan drug, uh, uh, orphan diseases. Uh, if you take the example of hypoparathyroidism, our lead indication, uh, this is. Uh, quite substantial indication. Just in the US, there are 80,000 patients uh, and uh, most of them are really in, clean, in need for a new therapy. In Europe, this is a little bit more, 110,000 patients. So this is not huge indications. It's not like type two diabetes or hypertension, but this is a, a very uh, a decent amount of patients who are in need for new treatments. So now, we certainly like the focus, skills, and expertise involved with Amelit Pharma. Can you share what you think are the three biggest risks and opportunities for the company's future? I like to focus on opportunities, right? Um, coming back to my introduction, uh, to me as a founder of this company, uh, the major opportunity is really to... Uh, provided this is the last company I found in my life, which is not sure, but uh, really to have an impact, uh, to, to, to have an impact on the life of the patients we are treating, uh, to have an impact um, on the uh, creating uh, new jobs uh, in Europe and in the US and maintaining them um, and feeling that uh, we have taken uh, a part in the, uh, in the society. So, uh, more concretely, I would say, uh, the opportunity is going to be a clinical uh, success. Uh, really, uh, when you have, you always begin with a, with a patent, you, uh, and then the animal models, and at the end of the day, you have to show data in phase two, phase three. These are going to be um, opportunities and risks because uh, we, we live, we just are doing research and development. So by definition, sometimes all programs are not successful. Uh, to mitigate that, we have a portfolio approach. We have three programs. We'll continue to acquire additional uh, programs to complete the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the portfolio. And uh, another opportunity that is also a risk is a financing. Uh, we are discussing that uh, a company like us uh, with time is going to need more and more uh, 
uh, money because we don't anticipate the first sale of uh, our drug before at least five years from now. Uh, so we'll have to raise a lot. We might have to go through a, a listed uh, uh, a market so to a stock exchange to make an IPO at some point. So uh, all that is risk, but it's very nice opportunities too. And finally, before we let you go today, is there anything that you would like to share with our audience here at Trial Site News? Uh, I think we covered quite well what is uh, what is uh, high level, what is uh, uh, Amolit Pharma. I just wanted to maybe to add uh, uh, that um, the, that it is important to me that uh, a company like that is not a European company, is not a US company, it's a global company. This is very important, especially we are working for in rare disease, so we have to be present where the patient is. So at least to me, uh, global is Europe and, uh, and the US, and I know at some point we'll have to think about Asia, et cetera, other, other countries. But given the size of family to be global is already uh, uh, European and uh, and, um, and US, so we have a, a presence in Boston. We are we are we are based in Lyon in France, uh, and we'll continue to to build the team uh, both sides. Uh, this is very important. Well, thank you, Doctor Abribat, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much, Adrian. It 